up your life, when God messes up your life, and I uh, and, uh, hope you'll uh, be faithful during this series. It's been something that's been kind of on my mind uh, for some time. I've been looking forward to it, and I hope it'll be a blessing to you. I want to say how thankful I am for these guys leading us in worship tonight. They did a great job, and uh, a couple, uh, couple of new faces uh, uh, they've switched some places here on me, but this good-looking fella down here, uh, this is Josh, and uh, he is a part of the 509th uh, Bomb Wing over at Whiteman Air Force Base, which is the uh, active side of the, uh, of the B-2 program at Whiteman Air Force, and, and this guy back over here is his brother, but not really, a uh, brother from another mother. This is Carlos, and he played the guitar for us tonight. They've been with us now a grand total of two times, and they're on the worship team. So what's the rest of y'all's problem, right? Uh, they... Uh, uh, we're thankful for them. They've done a great job, and, and it was really good to have you guys with us tonight. The rest of y'all are chopped liver, and uh, so uh, especially you, Ryan, because you've been with us the longest, but uh, we're, we're thankful for them. They did a great job leading us in worship. Uh, we're going to go ahead and collect an offering. Mr. Isaiah, you going to help me, buddy? Uh, you you got to pull double duty. You got to get both sides here, and uh, make sure Miss Wilma uh, gets money in there, and make sure Brother uh, Jim gets money in there. Don't, don't go nowhere until they do it, okay? Let's pray over tonight's offering. Father, thank you so so much for tonight and for the opportunity you've given to us to, uh, uh, to uh, gather together, to study your word and to look uh, at the Apostle Paul's life and what it might teach us about our own lives and specifically uh, how, you, uh, how you use a life and so drastically and so dramatically and tonight there could be real change uh, in our own hearts and minds, there could be real change in our own lives and our own city. Um, because when you move, when you uh, step in in power and move, uh, it's amazing what can transpire. And, uh, and that's what we see tonight in Acts chapter 9. We see a life that was uh, fundamentally messed up, just uh, from top to bottom, restructured and redone and just overwhelmed by your grace and, and uh, by an experience, a touch from heaven. And so that's what we want. We want our lives to reflect that as well. And, uh, and would we be so lucky to be uh, used by you in such a powerful way as the Apostle Paul was. And we won't get a chance to write scripture like he did because the canon is closed, but maybe we would touch lives across the globe uh, like he did, not for our own glory or renown, but for the kingdom, for your kingdom, for purposes, for the advancement of your kingdom as men and women come to faith in Jesus Christ. Would you uh, speak to our hearts and minds tonight in this place? And would we honor you in worship uh, and even in our giving now in this moment? In Jesus' name, amen. At Miss Pauline's uh, funeral uh, this past week, and uh, it was just uh, such an inspiration uh, uh, for me. I, I uh, was just overwhelmed, and uh, and uh, what a what a great testimony to be singing such words uh, as uh, at, a, at a time as that. Great is Thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Acts chapter nine. I'm going to speak on the subject matter tonight of when God messes up your life. When God messes up your life, you probably can't relate to that in any way, uh, but I can, and so uh, I want to speak on that subject matter tonight. And uh, going to uh, be a fairly short time together tonight in the Word. Just want to really set the stage for the uh, for the remainder of the series. But I think there's some good things here. Going to do a little bit of reading with me tonight, but. Uh, I think there's some good things there, and we're going to go kind of fast, but I uh, want to talk on this subject matter of when God messes up your life. One of my, uh, one of Ms. Uh, Zariah's favorite things in all the world to do is to take something that is perfectly constructed and to destroy it and do it all over again. Uh, you can probably relate to it, especially if you've had kids along the way, but uh, one of Zariah's favorite things to do is to sit down and to put a puzzle together, and then as soon as you get it put together, you destroy it, and then you try to put it back together, right? Or... Uh, when we were on the beach in Daytona, she wanted to spend uh, hours on end building sandcastles. And then as soon as we'd get those sandcastles built, she would walk around and stomp on them, you know, and, and get them knocked over so that she could do it all over again. It's no wonder that her and I are going to butt heads for the next 18 years or so because that, that type of thinking really rubs my OCD the wrong way. Uh, I, uh, one, I, I set my mind to a task and, and once I, I've got to stay on that task until it's done. And once it's done, I'm certainly not of the mind of destroying
in it just to do it all over again. But that's Sariah. And, uh, and one of the things that I thought about that uh, as we were gone for the last couple of weeks and thinking about what I was going to preach on and what was next in front of us, I just started thinking a little bit about that. And I thought how often we would, when we would do that, it would come back faster the second time and oftentimes more efficient and better done, right? That is that when she would do a, a puzzle, it seemed like the first time dad trying to be a helpful dad would let her really wade through things and figure out what piece went where or what, what bucket needed to go where for that sandcastle and so on and so forth. It seemed like the first time you do a project, it'd take a long, long time. But the second time, it'd be a little bit faster. You'd get it done a little bit faster and, and it would be a little more efficient. And a lot of times, the end product might even be a little bit better. Instead of some of those pieces being a little bent because you were trying to force them where they weren't supposed to go, all of a sudden, they would seem to be in the right spot at the right moment and, and there wouldn't need to be nearly as much help. And, uh, and I thought about that and how adequate a description that is of what God oftentimes does in our lives. We put our lives together and we think that they need to be a certain way. And then all of a sudden, something, some force comes into our life as disruptive as it is and destroys everything, blows it all to pieces so that it has to be rebuilt. And how many times over when it's rebuilt, it's rebuilt far better than it ever was in the first place, right? When I, in fact, I thought about that and I thought, I might even open this series up by asking you to, to lay out one word descriptions of what you think of God tonight. And I assume that if I did that, you might use some things like love and patience and kindness and, and goodness. You might say things like grace and savior and father and all kinds of things like that, right? But one of the things, one word that came to my mind as I thought about this series is disruptive. Disruptive. Does it bother you if I said tonight that God is disruptive? He is a disruptive God. We were in 2 Corinthians in chapter number 7 this morning, and I talked about how I long for a day. I love to see when God moves amongst his people and how there are certain things that seem to stand as roadblocks in the way of God's movement and how I, I love to read stories and hear stories about what God has done in people's lives over the year. I love even more to be a part of those stories, to see God show up in, in marvelous and majestic ways, unexpected, surprising ways. But one thing that is certain in all of the, almost all of those stories is that when God does show up, oftentimes what happens next is disruption, right? Not the peace we might have expected. There might be peace in hearts and minds because he always leads us in such a direction. But the, there, the, oftentimes in the surrounding circumstances, there's a little bit of chaos, it's kind of like people looking in, not knowing what's going on, go, well, what in the world just happened? Why did that take place? And, and how in the world did, did, did that take place without our knowledge and our understanding? And, and what was that going to do? In fact, I, I was, uh, uh, Pastor Tim gave me liberty tonight to share with you guys some information that we're going to be talking about over the next couple of months. And we've been praying about some needs here at our church. And, you know, it, it seems like uh, I was telling Dr. Loggins, I got back from vacation, and, and, uh, and, and uh, we, he had, I guess the first thing that happened was Pauline's funeral, and he'd had an opportunity to speak with some of the founding members and, and just really uh, survey and, and hear maybe for a fresh time again uh, where the church has been and and how we got to where we're at. And Dr. Loggins and I were standing out in the parking lot, and he said, you know, you have really, really, really been used by the Lord in this place. And, and really, it's just amazing what has happened in your pastorate here. And we were talking about that, and I said to him, I said, Doc, I, I said, I appreciate that, and I'm thankful for that. And to God be the glory if that, that's the case. But the reality is, when I got back from vacation, I was almost disheartened because I was reminded again of how great the work is that's still out in front of us. Like, we haven't gotten anywhere yet. There's so much more work to be done. There's a, a city full of lost people that, that still need somebody to go to them and, and draw them un, unto Jesus Christ. And we kind of talked about some of those things and talked through some of that. And, and it's been on uh, leadership in our church's hearts and minds as we've been praying about so many needs that are in front of us. One of the greatest needs in Sedalia, Missouri right now is mental health. And the church needs to be the force, the driving force behind that because there's no recovery without Jesus Christ, right? Right? And we need to be a driving force, but how do you do that? And, and, and mental health is like trying to boil the ocean. How in the world do you ever do that? It just seems like a, a monumental task. We've been looking for a youth associate, and, and there's, there's needs there in the youth department, and, and the list just kind of goes on from there, right? 
And I was back from vacation uh, about, uh, I guess, just a little more than 48, 72 hours. And, and Pastor Tim come walking into my office on Monday afternoon after the funeral. And he said, hey, listen, uh, you know what's going on in my life. And I've been praying about some things. And wanted to let you know that, uh, that uh, I, I believe it's time for me to transition here at Cornerstone Baptist Church. And I said, well, what do you mean by that, Pastor Tim? And he said, well, I, I've just really been seeking the heart of the Lord on this matter. And, and I believe that I'm supposed to, to serve as a pastor in this church, but not be paid for it. I said, well, glory to God. Amen. I'm excited about that, right? I said, I said, well, what do you mean? Explain that to me. He says, well, you know, the time has come for me to relinquish all the youth responsibilities and time has come for me to relinquish some other responsibilities because somebody else, God's going to raise somebody else up to use those things and, and do those things. But I still want to pastor, still want to be an executive pastor, still want to do administration, strategic planning and all those things. And, I, and I, I just don't think that the church ought to pay me to do that. I think I ought to do this. And he laid out a plan there and, and what he wanted to do for a transition roadmap and all those things. And I got to tell you, you know, I, I thought to myself, well, you know, at first I thought, well, that sounds kind of exciting. And then the other side of it, I went, well, I don't, I don't know. This seems like this is going to disrupt. Over, over the last eight years, there's been one constant. Administrative assistants have changed and, and, and other figures have changed over the time and ministry's been reshaped and redone. But every Monday morning when I walked in the office, I knew that, that Pastor Tim was going to be there. And, and I, don't, I don't know if I'm okay with that. I, I kind of want to keep status quo, so to speak. When God messes up your life, sometimes it seems like to outside forces there's disruptive things. You know what I mean? That always seems like it accompanies when God's getting ready to do something amazing. The book of Acts can rightly be divided into two sections. The first part is really about the apostle Peter and his work in Jerusalem and to the Jews. And the second half is about Luke's other hero, and that's the apostle Paul. And it's all about his work amongst the Gentiles and, and those that, uh, that, that nobody even realized the gospel was going to go to. And the Apostle Paul's story, his journey really begins here in Acts chapter 9. He's first mentioned in Acts chapter 8, at the beginning of Acts chapter 8, following the stoning of Stephen. We find out that there was a man there that, that, the, that the cloaks were laid at, and that was a man by the name of Saul. And he shows up and he begins to become a prominent figure in the book of Acts and the story. In fact, if you go back with me to chapter number 8, in verse number 1 we hear, and, Paul, and Saul approved of his execution, speaking of Stephen. And it says, And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except, and, uh, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church. And entering house after house as he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. This is a getting, getting ready to be, and it's almost kind of ominous. You and I know how the rest of the story plays out. So we know that Saul is going to become Paul and God's going to use him in a mighty way. But it catches us, if we're not knowing the end of the story, a little bit kind of like, well, why the detail? Why tell us about this fellow? It's a foreshadowing, as my grammar teacher would tell me, right? It's, it's, a, it's, it's pointing us towards something in the future, even though we don't fully yet understand what it is that it's pointing us to. We get to chapter number 9, and this fellow shows up. Beginning in verse number 1, it says, But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, he went to the high priest, and he asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found anyone belonging to the way, that is, that they had trusted in Jesus Christ, if he found anybody belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. You get the picture here. This Saul has gone from somebody who simply approved of an execution to by the time we find him in chapter 9, which is a short time span, all of a sudden now he is the driving force of persecution in Jerusalem. In fact, he has gotten permission from the major religious leaders to do whatever it takes to exercise the gospel from Jerusalem. That is, to get it out, to drive it out by whatever means are necessary, imprisonment and killing, executing, whatever he needs to do, drive those people who have trusted in Christ completely out of Jerusalem. Let's be done with them and get them out of here. And apparently, the apostle writer tells us, or the Acts writer tells us, uh, we, which we believe is Luke, he tells us that Saul is very passionate about this. He is ravaging the church. But we don't have to take Luke's word for it because the Apostle Paul writes of this time in his life in the book of Philippians in chapter number three to a passage that you are very familiar with. 
The Apostle Paul there posts his commitment to Christ is speaking about how none of us has anything worth bragging about in all of life. And we pick up the story in verse number four, the second half of verse number four. He says, though I myself had reason for confidence in the flesh. In other words, if you want to brag about who you are and what you've accomplished, I I believe that I alone would have good reason to brag about such things. If anyone else thinks that he has reason or confidence in the flesh, I have all the more. Circumcised on the eighth day, according to the law, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. In other words, as the Apostle Paul looks back post his conversion to Jesus Christ, at this period of time in his life, Acts chapter 9, at this period of time in his life, he said that there were very few people that could hold a candle to him. He was a righteous man. He was a moral man under the law. He was passionate about what he was doing. He believed that he was doing God's will in persecuting the church. He saw these people of the way, these Christians, as those who were really the disruptive force of Jerusalem. They were going to create great havoc. They were going to cause problems. Rome was probably going to come in and conquer and and maybe even this time wipe Israel completely off the map uh, because these people of the way, these gospel believers, these Christians, these little Christians, Listen, they thought that they had finally found the Messiah, and Paul was there to tell them what what, what heresy that was. He wanted to stand up for God. I think that's part of Paul's story that we oftentimes miss. When we look at Saul's life and his history here, we're dealing with a man who sincerely believed what he was doing. Even though he was sincere, he was sincerely wrong, but he was sincere about it. He believed that he was doing exactly what God wanted him to do. And that's where chapter 9 begins, that this guy named Saul is doing exactly what God's wanting him to do, and he's doing it with passion. He is doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing, living a moral life. He's driving out. He is doing God a favor by acting the way that he is. We pick it up in verse number three. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. It says in verse number four, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said to him, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand, and they brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. I think it's significant there that he was this way for three days because it was foreshadowing that his identification with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as we uh, symbolize such things in baptism. But whatever the case, God has literally knocked Saul off of his horse. He is on the way to do God's mission. He is on the way to live this moral life. He is on the way to do God a favor. He is on the way to do what God has commanded him to do, to drive out the heretics, to make sure that the purity of the Jewish theology stayed right there, right? And he is doing it well so that he is entrusted by the most elite of the religious to carry out this mission. And he's accomplishing it, doing it well, and suddenly God knocks him right off his horse and he goes blind he can't see anything I wonder you know it's obvious there that we could relate many many more metaphors to that but I wonder how many of us could relate to such type moments Maybe we can't remember a time when God took something so drastic away from us as our vision or took something so drastic away from us in a physical sense, but we remember a moment when it's almost as though we we thought we were doing exactly what we were supposed to be doing, and all of a sudden God just knocked us off the horse, knocked us out of the way we were traveling, and stopped us right in our tracks. Verse number 10, now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. There's an entire sermon right there that even in the New Testament, these disciples, these followers of Christ, and by the way, Ananias is not really well known. He's not one of the big guys, right? 
And yet he's faithfully serving in Damascus, and apparently he knows the voice of the Lord. The Lord says, hey, Ananias, and he says, here I am, Lord. I'm ready and willing to do whatever you want me to do. Verse number 11, and the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias who come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Now, here's where the story takes an interesting turn, because not only is Saul's life messed up, but now Ananias' life gets messed up. Because here's a man who's faithfully serving the Lord, doing what God has called him to do, and apparently he must have been maybe even praying in this moment when God visits him, but he's, whatever he's doing, he's meditating on the word, he's praying, whatever he's doing, and God all of a sudden speaks to him and says, Ananias, I got a job for you. He says, here I am, I'm ready to go, and he says, I want you to go find this guy named Saul, and apparently it sent chills down Ananias' spine. Saul was known to him, right? Ananias knows who the Lord sent him to, and now all of a sudden his life's about to be messed up. Because he says back to the Lord, essentially, wait a second, I've heard about this fellow, verse number 13. Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call upon your name. In other words, am I hearing this correctly, right? Do I need to change a channel or something? Maybe this is some big trick, right? Maybe I'm hearing a voice, and remember, this is a more superstitious society than we live in today. Maybe I'm hearing a voice, and it's not really the voice of the Lord. Doesn't God know who that person is? Ever heard or felt like the Lord called you to do something? I'm not saying necessarily in an audible voice, but something inside of you was stirred, and you're supposed to go do something, and, and all the while you're thinking, well, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life, right? It's okay to laugh, right? We've been there, right? You think to yourself, well, I don't, I don't know if, maybe, maybe God's radar uh, has gotten skewed, right? Maybe he doesn't realize what he's asking me to do. This, this is probably not going to go well, right? This, this doesn't make any sense. And that's what Ananias essentially says in this moment. God, I, you, know, you know, listen, I, I'm here. I'm, a, I'm available. I'm willing. But I don't think you know what you just asked me to do. I've heard about this fellow. Notice the, the intense terminology he uses about Saul. I've heard about the evil this man is doing. I mean, he didn't say this guy's a bad dude. He didn't say, hey, listen, I heard this guy was a convict. He didn't say, hey, listen, I think this guy could be a problem. He says, listen, I've heard about the evil, pure evil this guy is. And you want me to go over there and talk to him? Verse 15. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. Verse 17, so Ananias departed and he entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, I want you to stop there for a moment. Two lives have been radically messed up in just a matter of a few moments for the gospel. One is a faithful believer who's been given instructions that he, th he thinks are just plain silly, just doesn't make any sense at all. The other is not a believer, but he thinks that he is. He thinks he's doing what God's wanting him to do, and he thinks he's doing what God's called him to do, but he's been literally knocked off his horse, and he doesn't even have sight now. God has taken away his ability to do what he was previously doing and, and only told him to go on to the next city and that he's going to provide somebody there who's going to come lay hands on him. And with no other further instruction than that, so two lives have been utterly confounded and messed up. Ananias has shared with us what he's concerned about in this moment. He says to the Lord, I don't think this is a good idea. I've heard about this man. I've heard about his evil. But apparently, when God spoke back to Ananias, something shifted. You say, how do you know that? Because now, when Ananias arrives on the scene, did you notice what he called Paul? He says, brother Saul. You don't call somebody brother who's your enemy, do you? I think that's miraculous. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, and immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight and then he arose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. Two lives messed up. 
But all of a sudden, Ananias shows us what can happen instantaneously when we just trust the voice of the Lord. Principle application number one tonight is when your life gets messed up by God, the only thing you can trust in is still him. Sometimes when our life gets messed up, when things around us seem to get a little chaotic, when we don't know how to understand or what to do with them, our natural reaction is to hop in and decide we're going to solve it, we're going to fix it, we're going to do things our way. Now, none of you would do that, but Miss Kelly does it all the time. Uh, and that is that we, we, our lives start to get chaotic and we say, you know, somebody's got to take the reins. Somebody's got to be in charge. Seems like God may be on vacation or maybe he's taking a little bit of break from us. So we'll just take a control. And Ananias shows us a perfect picture of what can happen when we don't do that. Notice that it doesn't say anything about Saul deciding to try to chop off Ananias' head. Now, Saul doesn't know all the things. He's, he's met Jesus, but he still don't understand everything. And, and, you know, he might have still thought maybe somebody's bewitched me. Maybe somebody's fooled me. Maybe somebody's conjured up a spirit against me. Maybe, you know, there might have been a stubbornness left, it, left in him that said, you know, I, I, I've, been hurt, I've heard about these things in, 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 in Jewish history. I'm not going to believe this. I, I'm going to just fight against it. He might have still tried to separate Ananias' head from his shoulders. I don't know. But the, the Acts writer doesn't say any of that transpired. Ananias just shows up. And he turns to Paul, turns to Saul in this moment, and he says, Brother, I was sent by Jesus. The Jesus that met you on the road. And I was sent because God's going to use you in a big, big way. And I was supposed to pray for you, lay my hands on you. And you be filled by the Holy Spirit. And as soon as he does it, instantaneously the scales fall off and his sight's restored. Point being, I, I want to I make this point clear tonight. God, sometimes he messes up our lives, turns them in unexpected ways. And the only thing we know that, to do in such moments is what Ananias did, and that is to say, well, if this is really what you want, I'll just trust you. I'll just believe you know what you're doing. We had that opportunity to say goodbye to Miss Pauline, and Miss Kelly and I had the opportunity. We, we met with her before we left on vacation, and then... The family called us uh, last day we were there, and, and they said, hey, would you spend a few moments and pray with her? And so we did that over the phone and, and got to kind of hear her last vocalization as she passed away a few minutes after we got off the phone. And, and this week we had that opportunity to, to celebrate what happens when, when a saint leaves this place, sets aside those earthly cares. And I shared in the funeral service, I'll, I'll never forget that day in April when when uh, we got the phone call that Pauline had had a stroke a year ago last April. And, and they said, you know, we're not really sure what's going on. They've taken her to Columbia. And, and we thought she'd had a stroke and she'd recover from that. And we get up there and all of a sudden the doctor is there, comes in while we're sitting with the family and says, listen, I, I think things are a little more dire than you understand. And she's got lung cancer. Hadn't, hadn't smoked a cigarette a day in her life. You got stage four lung cancer and it's metastasized in your brain. And and if you don't do any treatment on this, you, you, you've, you've probably got about two months to live. I remember just looking at Ernie and, and saying, Ernie, we're, it, it's going to be okay. We're going to take this one step at a time, one day at a time. Listen, it's easy for somebody who's not directly going through it to say such things, isn't it? But I can remember the confidence in Ernie's eyes. And I said something to, along, these, uh, along these lines. And I said, brother, I said, we've trusted God to get us to this point. We're just going to trust him with tomorrow. And Brother Ernie said with tears in his eyes, you bet, brother, that's all we got. That's all we got. Ananias, in this moment, he could have said when God messed up his life, listen, I'll check back in with you later. <laughs> but instead what he did was he said, if this is really what you want me to do, even, even essentially putting his life into the hands of God and saying, if this is what you really want me to do and this means my death, okay, I'll go down this road with you because I want to be faithful. First thing you can do when God messes up your life is just simply put your faith and trust in him. You know what that looks like? There's an entire sermon here as well. You know what that looks like? Well, it's easy to tell you what it looks like by telling you what it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like this. God, you're in charge. Now, here's what I'm going to do, right? God, you, you, you make the decisions from this point, over, from this point forward. I'll let you do this and, this and this and this and this and this. But one thing that's not negotiable right? <laughs> One thing you can't do is you, you can't take this thing from me, right? Because after all, I know I can't live without that. So I know you wouldn't take it anyway, but I just thought I would mention it, right? And I didn't do any of that when God messed up his life and he said, I want you to go over here and I want you to deal with this guy who's probably going to kill you. 
because I've got a purpose for him. I want you to go and lay hands on him. You also notice, and maybe it was not in the text, but Luke doesn't tell us that God gave any promise to Ananias that he was going to live through the encounter. He just told him what he wanted to do with Saul. He said, he's a chosen vessel. I want you to lay hands on him. I want you to restore his sight. But he doesn't say, hey, you're going to survive this encounter. But Ananias, apparently, somewhere in the stillness of that moment, said, God, if that's what you want, if that's what you want, my life is yours. I'll go do it. When God messes up our life, number one, best thing we can do is just trust him. Trust him with that mess. Number two, we keep on going. Second half of verse 19. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. This is speaking about Paul. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues. Let me say that again. I want you to underline it. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues. 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 What did he immediately do? He proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues. But what did he immediately come from? having persecuted the church, having been violent toward the church, having been uh, uh, approving of an execution of a great man like Stephen. He just came out of an amazing situation where he was on one side, he was a Cubs fan one moment and a Cardinals fan the next, right? On one moment, he's cheering on the people of the gospel being killed and literally, literally, he gets knocked off a horse, Paul does, and he loses his sight. He has to sit there for three days. And he sits there for three days and Ananias shows up. <coughs> and Ananias does exactly what the Lord tells him to do. He prays for him, lays hands on him. Paul receives the spirit of God. His eyes, scales fall off of him. <coughs> Excuse me. He has his sight restored to him. And immediately, Luke says, immediately, thank you, brother. Immediately, immediately, he starts telling people about Jesus. You know what it doesn't say? <clears throat> doesn't say God messed up Paul's life, Saul's life. He came to faith in Christ. He took a new members class. He joined into a Sunday school class. He decided to do discipleship training with Dr. Loggins. He then decided to attend Sunday night evenings to show that he was really spiritually uh, superior. Amen, right? Uh, he, he, he signed up for the worship team, right, to get discipled there, even though he couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. It doesn't say any of those things. It says God messed up his life. God messed up his life. But he came to faith in Christ, apparently in that process. He went from somebody who hated Christ, who hated the people of Christ, to somebody who was believing in Christ. And the next thing we find of him is he's out there telling people about Jesus. Principle number two. We're going to see this play out in a major way here. Principle number two. Not only when our lives get messed up should we learn to trust Christ in such moments, but number two, it doesn't take Christ very long to take up that messed up life and to put it back together. It doesn't take Jesus very long to take that mess and transform it into a masterpiece. Immediately, there he is in the synagogues proclaiming Jesus. He was saying, end of verse number 20, he is the son of God. Listen to verse 21. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is this not the man who, was, who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. Simple terms. Simple terms. You ready? He was really good at what he was doing. He was really good. He was really good at convincing people that Jesus was the Son of God. He was apparently a really gifted orator. He was a really gifted speaker. He was a really gifted mouthpiece. Isn't that amazing? God takes the greatest persecutor in the entire story of the new church and instantaneously messes up his life. And then sends him out. And he's highly, highly, highly effective. Beloved, every once in a while, we should celebrate when God messes up our lives because maybe he's going to make us more effective than we've ever been. 
Verse 23, when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. <laughs> Isn't that funny? By the way, this could be application number three tonight, and I'll, I'll just put it out there for you. God messes up your life. Don't expect that he's not going to do it again. <laughs> Saul, here he is. He's been knocked off his horse. His whole life's been turned upside down. He's gone from Jesus hater to Jesus lover, proclaimer. You would think at this moment, God would say, hey, listen, you've come a long way. Take it easy for a little while. Just, you know, travel the countryside, tell people about my son, right? You know, he might say to him, hey, listen, you've, you've done a great deed. A lot of people have come to faith in Christ. And most importantly, people who have come to faith in Christ, their mortality rate has, defi- has declined, right? Because you're not killing all of them. But instead, what God does is says, I think I'm gonna mess it up one more time. I think I'm gonna mess things up a little bit more because I'm not quite done yet. Now all of a sudden, the very people that Paul had maybe even trained for their mission, all of a sudden, guess what? Now they're the ones hunting him. Skip down to verse 26, almost done. <clears throat> and when he'd come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples and they were all afraid of him. You better believe they were for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and he disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned of this, listen, they brought him down to Caesarea and they sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Principle number four, when God messes up your life, he's always got a greater kingdom plan in mind. The difference between God and Zariah is Zariah sometimes messes up things just for the fun of messing it up. When God messes something up, he does it with an intentional plan in mind. And listen, it's always about his own glory. Not only did he want to change Saul, not only did he want to set him on a new course and a new direction in life, but God also, and most importantly, he wanted to multiply his kingdom. He messed up his life for a direct result in the kingdom business. So, this would be my encouragement to you tonight. I said it was going to be short. I'll I'll keep my word. This would be my my encouragement to you tonight. God can at times be a very disruptive force in our lives. But he is not disruptive without intentionality. Tonight, if you look at your life and you say, it seems like God has messed everything up. I want you to know he's done it for a reason. He's done it for a reason. The journey of Saul. Next time we see him, Saul is going to turn himself into Paul and be used by the kingdom greatly. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you so much for tonight and for the opportunity you've given us to be reminded again that you intentionally work in our lives, disrupt things at times, to mess us all up, to make a mess. Father, you do so not to create havoc, without intentionality, but to make us into the people you want us to be, to teach us to trust you and to bring glory to your own self as the kingdom is multiplied and built. Here's where I'm at tonight. Father, you know this all so well. Sometimes I'm afraid of being a little messed up. Sometimes I'm afraid of what that means and what that looks like because I'm not in control. I'm not in charge. Tonight, would you impress upon my heart that I don't, I don't need to be afraid of such matters, but rather, I need to embrace them because I trust you and you alone. Not by strength and might or power, not holding things back and saying you can do this, but you can't do this, but fully trusting you. And indeed, we could sing with the saints of old, Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Do business with your people in this place tonight, even if that means you must knock us off of our horse. 
In Jesus' name, amen.